Hi, everyone, and welcome to Happy Not Satisfied. My name is Dan Morrison, and I'm the founder of Happy Not Satisfied and the host of this podcast. Uh, so today we have an incredible guest, someone who is highly, highly accomplished uh, in entertainment as a leader, as a visionary, uh, and beyond. And I could probably spend 20 minutes just reading his bio, but I will give you some very high level things before we jump in here. Uh, he was the president of Fox's Cable Networks, the CEO of Time, Inc., the CEO of Imagine Entertainment, uh, and many, many other positions that he's held along the way. So it's my distinct pleasure to welcome to the podcast, Rich Batista. Thanks for being here. Dan, it's a pleasure. Um, so I think, and we were we were talking about this a little bit, but before we get into some of the the deeper details here of what we're going to get into, I, I would love to hear a little bit more about your path because I know we've talked, and I know it's not what someone might call traditional, especially mm -hmm. if you're coming from a business standpoint. So if you could just give us a little bit of your background, I think it would help sure. set this conversation up. Sure. Um, just quickly, uh, my background: I grew up in the East Coast in the Boston area. I grew up in a um, Grew up with, in a big Italian family with working class roots. Um, my dad had 10 brothers and sisters. My mom had six brothers and sisters. Um, and they were all in the, they were all, um, uh, you know, in working class roles. And so I think, I think maybe one of my aunts and uncles went to college out of all of them. So I grew up in a, in a, a very, very tight knit family. I had numerous, numerous cousins and it's a really neat way to grow up. Um, and, but you know, when I was young, I always was always enamored with entertainment media. I was I was the kid who you know memorized TV Guide and the, and watched way too much television. And um, you know, I loved the news. I was always kind of a news junkie as a kid. And um, as I got older, I did performing and musical theater and things. So I always had this sort of interest in that area. Um, and um, but, you know, coming from where I came from, it just seemed so out of the realm of possibility. How on earth am I ever going to work in entertainment or Hollywood? How could I ever work in a television company? I had no connections in any way. And, you know, my dad was a self-made man. He was a, a businessman who you know, was quite successful and worked really hard. And so I always thought I'd want to go into business. So I after college, I went to Georgetown University, and had a you know, tremendous experience there. I did one of those traditional jobs, which is I worked at Morgan Stanley in their investment banking program. And I just thought that would be an amazing foundation. And as you probably know, those are incredibly demanding jobs. Uh, and uh, I felt very fortunate to get a role there and, and you know, did quite well there. And, and I decided to go to business school because, again, I that theme of wanting to work in business. And I felt like getting an MBA would be a great thing to do. Either if I wanted to go back into investment banking or if I wanted to branch out beyond it. And um, I went to business school in Boston, Harvard Business School. And it's really when I was there when I started seeing this was in the in the late 80s. Um, and I started noticing MBA types who were going into entertainment media, you know, historically, 50s, 60s, 70s, uh, entertainment was very mom and pop business, you know, they're, they're uh, And then in the 70s, 80s, you started seeing big conglomerates buy a lot of these big entertainment media companies and these big studios and they became much more sophisticated companies much more complex they required more rigor and analysis and so mba types started uh started penetrating that world for better or for worse hmm. um and so i saw some folks some who went to harvard some who did and i said boy like maybe i can do this and really while i was at harvard business school i made you know a pretty big decision that i was going to pursue working in entertainment media. And it's really important to understand the, the the environment back then, which was it was very, very uncommon to um, and very untraditional to work in entertainment media. Um, nowadays, they have these treks and they come to campus and a lot of a lot of MBA students are interested in, in the business. But back then, it wasn't like that. And there were like a half dozen of us who were interested in that field. But, you know, no Disney came to campus and nobody else. You had to make your own path in terms of understanding where to get connections and there was no alumni networking book you could look at and you really had to pound the pavement yourself and that's what I did and and you also have to be willing to in some cases graduate without a job so you know here I say to my parents you know who again working class folks were like you need to get a job and get paid well and I said you know what I'm going to graduate without a job I'm not going to go back to Morgan Stanley even though 
you know, they certainly wanted me back and we had a lot of discussions. I said, look, I really want to try this. And, um, and so I did. And I graduated without a job and, and got a job at Fox in like July of after graduation. And I think I moved to LA two days later hmm. and had the ability, you know, had the, had the fortune of working at a company that was growing like leaps and bounds at that time, and cable and sports and such, and was able to, you know, start my career there and, and build it uh, from there. That's great. And that's yeah, that's super helpful to hear. And I think knowing that somebody who went to obviously a prestigious institution like Harvard and then graduating without a job, I'm sure that wasn't easy. I'm sure you were getting pressure from all angles on that one. It really was. And, you know, funny too, you know, the other, other, my student, fellow students would just look at you like you had two heads because yeah. they just didn't get it. They thought, oh, you want to be a movie director? And I'm like, no, they actually have business jobs in Hollywood, just mm-hmm. like they do in every other corporate setting you know they have people in marketing and people in finance and people in strategy and people in human resources and um and it was a it, certainly an education process with, with a lot of people but uh you know it's it's probably the most arguably the most important decision i made maybe in my life because it it brought me to the path that that was the one that i was you know most excited about and yeah uh, it, it would have been hard to get in any other you know any other way it reminds me too, I was just having a conversation with my wife about our own sort of personal journeys here. And and we were making a big decision and ultimately said no fear-based decisions. And mm-hmm. it sounds like that's the place that you've come from a lot yeah. too. Um, so I really cool. have. I'm a, I, I've taken, as we can talk about in this podcast, I've taken a number of risks and twists and turns in my career. I, I've, I'm not someone who just says, hey, I want to work in the same job for 20 years. I've, I've, I've been definitely one of the hallmarks of my career is I've taken opportunities and seized opportunities and moved around to different opportunities. And I, you know, I've, I've never been one who believes in like creating like a five-year plan. I, I've always feel sure. like that limits you. Yeah. And I think that's served me well because it's allowed me to seize opportunities that maybe otherwise on paper I wouldn't have, but have been really important to my career development. Um. Yeah. I mean, a hundred percent. So I would be curious Obviously, you've had a lot of roles and you've done a lot of things, but you, one of the big roles is you've been CEO of several organizations. Right. Um, and I think some people have somewhat of an idea of what that is, but what is that? Like, you know, for mm-hmm. the people that don't know or or are interested in learning, like, what does the CEO do? Yeah. It's funny. I've been answering this question more lately because I've, I have twin 18-year-old boys and they're starting to ask me that question. And <laughs> in fact, what did you do at Time Inc. exactly? And, you know, look, I, I kind of, probably separate into two. One is that you're sort of the chief strategy, visionary, sort of front ambassador of the company. That's kind of one bucket. And I think the other bucket is you're the chief, you know, overseer of the operations and performance of the company. And obviously Mm -hmm. those need to fuse together, but they they actually, I think in some cases require different skill sets. Um, But, you know, most importantly, like I said, it's really setting a vision building a team that's that's um believes in that vision and then overseeing it monitoring it on a literally on an hourly basis and um you know as i say to people it motivate motivating people inspiring people managing people is such a big part of the job like showing off those leadership traits um as i as i said many times before you know, a lot of the job of CEO is dealing with problems. You know, mm-hmm. I, I joke, you know, people don't usually call and say, hey, just wanted to call and say everything's going great. You know, <laughs> typically when people call, it's because it may not be a problem, but it may be a situation you have to deal with or a important decision you have to make. Um, and so uh, so that's one. The other thing is, I think being a CEO, I think to be a successful CEO requires a, a quite a versatile set of attributes, you know, because one minute you're, you know, meeting with a Wall Street analyst, right? And then an hour later, you may be, in my case, I've worked in creative environments, right? So the next hour, I may be sitting down looking at a magazine cover when I was at Time Inc. or at, when I ran over saw FX, I may be looking at a cut of a television show, right? And then two hours later, I'm looking at our um, a marketing plan for one of our you know, for for one of our business. And then the next hour, maybe meeting with an advertising client, you know, and the next hour, I may be looking at a strategy deck to, or brainstorming a new business idea with some, some of my colleagues. So that is incredible breadth that's required in that. And, you know, not everyone's 
amazing at all of those and, and the ones that you're not as good at you have people obviously that that have that experience to help fill in the gaps but that's in some cases it's one of the things i like the most about seeing about being a ceo i really do enjoy leading teams and i really enjoy bringing teams together to kind of all row in the same direction to achieve a, a goal together I, I really um get a lot of passion from that but the second piece is i really enjoy the diversity of the role mm. Um, and, and and having to pull from different parts of your skill sets. Yeah. And, you know, obviously you're in an inherently creative industry, but it seems that somebody who is a leader, especially a CEO, and it has to be a visionary, that that really is creative mind and business mind, almost no matter what, I think, because sure. if you're leading, even if it's a company making pencils or whatever, sure. like you have to have a creative vision for how to stay relevant in the marketplace, right? Sure. Yeah. And also I've always challenged people in, in what you consider less creative parts of the business that their jobs also require creativity, right? So let's say you're in the legal department. Maybe there's a new way to structure contracts that require creativity or in the finance department, maybe there's a new, new way to uh, organize your department to make it more efficient. That mm -hmm. requires creativity. That requires thinking more deeply beyond sort of just the, the rote day-to-day -day activities. Yeah, and so absolutely. I, to I totally agree. I, I, creativity certainly is required even in a less creative industry, if you will. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and thanks for that background and, and kind of what goes into that role. And I think Obviously, looking at someone like you who has been a CEO and is highly successful and has done all these amazing things kind of now ties into the next point and sort of the thread for this podcast where I always ask everybody some time that you created your own luck. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I look at you and it's like, wow, this guy is incredible. He's done all these things I like that I aspire to do. Um, and I, I hope I don't think like, oh, he probably just got lucky. I don't, but I'm sure it would be easy to think that, you know, that's the easy mm -hmm. way out is just assume, mm -hmm. well, I can't do that because I didn't have that guy's luck. Yeah. Um, so I'd love to hear just some specific times maybe that you feel like you created that quote unquote luck. Yeah. Well, one example is the one I, I actually just spoke about, which was when I made the decision to pursue entertainment media in grad school. Um, because again, that decision required it that's a, i think a great example of making your own luck because it required i think tremendous discipline it required working harder than a normal person re getting recruited or looking to work in an industry where again so many of them are very traditional and there's very traditional paths on how you can apply for jobs or how you learn about jobs and so it required a lot of resourcefulness a lot of self-motivation um and so i think that's a, a really great example a second example um, that I give that really was an important turning point in my career, early in my career, was, you know, I was working at Fox and I was running, uh, I was the day-to-day -day guy running what was called our paid television division. And I'd been promoted to vice president and, you know, doing really well there. And I'd been there about three years at that point. But I sort of looked around and I said, you know what, this is a great job, but it's really, there's no creativity you know, I work in entertainment in Hollywood, but I don't really touch the product. You know, by the time I'm selling a movie to HBO, that that movie was made, you know, two years ago. So, boy, I'd really love to find a way to to get more involved in the creative process. And so at the time, the FX network was being launched um, actually out of New York City. And they have, were building at that time, FX was launched with all these original programming, original programs. It was like seven hours of daily programming, very different than what it is today. It was a very novel idea. And we did it all out of this um uh, this 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 20 story building in New York City and we built studios there and the like. And they, you know, they were looking for people around the country, across the company who may want to work there. And I said, boy, this is a great example to get in to maybe the creative side. I've always been interested in you know, the producing side of television and they were, they're looking to hire junior producers. I said, well, you know, I'm a corporate executive in Los Angeles. It's be a little bizarre to say, Hey, I'm willing to move to New York and basically cut my pay by two thirds um, and be a segment producer where I have zero experience. And I kind of went to my bosses and told them this and they did think I was a little crazy. Hmm. And then when they saw that I was serious about it, they were like, well, wait a minute. Like, you know, we, we, you know, let's find a, a role for Rich that we think, you know, will create more value for us. And it turned out that they were looking for a head sort of financial person to run kind of the business operations of this new production entity in New York. And they asked me if I wanted to do it. Um, 
And I made the decision to say yes, because in that way, I kind of got the best of both worlds. I was able to have a more senior job with keep the, keep the similar salary and compensation, but I was also able to work in a very creative environment. And overnight, I learned what it what it meant to produce television. So, you know, so I up then moved out of Los Angeles, moved back to New York City. Um, actually, met my wife there, which is also a great making your own luck, I guess. Mm -hmm. um, but that's another example where, you know, I worked really hard to make a decision that I think again, led to some, for me, re-engineered my career. And after I had done that job, most of my jobs be, after that at, at Fox and beyond had a, a real creative element to it, um, be it running cable networks and things like that. So that was a game changer for me. Yeah, absolutely. Um, it's funny you say you met your wife. I I moved from Illinois. I was, lived in Illinois my whole life and just decided to take a job in Texas. Didn't know anyone there, didn't know anything. I just knew it was a good opportunity. And I also met my wife there and now we have a little baby and like the Love rest it. is history. So Love yeah, it. I can relate. You. Good yeah. for you. Right. Um, I think also you had mentioned one other story about creating love. Yeah, I yeah. Really I think by... an, another one, yeah, a little later in my career is related to timing. Um, so uh, I'd worked in timing for a couple of years and I uh, was fortunate enough to be named the CEO of the company. And as you probably know, the magazine industry is going through some pretty seismic changes um, and going through some difficulties. However, Time Inc., we were the number one magazine publisher in the world, and we were also building tremendous revenue and assets um, outside of the magazine division because we had these great brands. We had about 20 brands, People and Fortune and Time and Sports Illustrated and InStyle and many others. And you know, we sort of said, let's look at these as brands, not look, let's not look at these as magazines. Let's not mm -hmm. define them by that medium. Because, you know, we own food and wine, for example. Why aren't we doing a wine club, right? And People Magazine, why aren't we creating television shows? Because we do this incredible reporting. We unearth all these amazing stories that we publish every week. Why aren't we converting some of these to television? Why aren't we doing more in the live event space with our brands? Um, and so on. So, um, in the process of taking that job on, you know, we did have suitors who wanted to buy us. Um, and we had one particular suitor we were talking quite a bit with. And we went through a very lengthy process, which was very tough on our company and our employees because this was all public knowledge. It all got into the press. And, you know, it's very hard to run a company when people think you may be getting sold or, mm -hmm. you know, it, it creates a lot of instability. And, and it, you know, at the end of the day, we didn't feel like we were getting the price that we deserved. And, and the process was just going on too long. And, you know, I, I with obviously with the board support made the decision to cut cut the process and say, look, we're not for sale. We're not going to talk about being for sale. We're going to stay independent. We think we have tremendous opportunities as an independent company. But at the same time, I felt like we did need to do some pretty important strategic things to to improve the company and, and set it up for a successful long term path. And um, you know. For example, one of them was we, I wanted to do a portfolio review. I felt like we had too many brands and we should probably sell some, right? That maybe weren't as strategic and core. Um, we wanted to, we thought our cost structure needed to be resized. So we did a major cost cost out program. We had to refinance our, our debt and we needed to take care of that. So we checked that box. We did that. Um, and, and, among, and among some other things. And at the end of the day, it really did help the company and it put in a, it gave us a blueprint for the future but also not surprisingly six months later that suitor came back and i was able to present to them a much what i felt was a much healthier company that had a much better path i'd done a lot of the hard work that they didn't have to do and they ended up we ended up selling the company but we got a higher price than we would have gotten so i you know for me that just showed you know, tremendous hard work that throughout our entire company that was that was done in order to, you know, make the company better and eventually put it in a in a better place where we sold it. Yeah, I I think that's such a perfect example of kind of what I'm I'm trying to extract from these stories of of people creating their own luck because that that truly shows the path from <laughs> someone wanted to buy it, you didn't like the price. You put in all this work behind the scenes that no one knew about, and then lo and behold, you got even a, a better price than you right. were even hoping and, for. And 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 to be fair, it was a risky move. You know, yeah. there are definitely people who said, "Just sell now, don't get it while it's hot." Right, like yeah. bird in the hand. And I said, "I got it," but I just 
feel strongly that that this company is more valuable than that. And I believe there are ways we can improve this company by making uh, some of these moves I've listed. So, you know, it wasn't without risk, that's for sure. Yeah. Well, you made a decision that wasn't based in fear, right? It's kind of been this, yeah. the, the moral of the story for, I think, your whole life. And it was not, a calculated, not, it, it was a calculated yeah. risk. It wasn't a, yeah. you know, it wasn't a rec reckless risk. It was a calculated risk. Sure. Well, that's good. But I think that's, yeah. uh, you could think, oh, this guy just waited around, got the price he wanted. Like, oh, how lucky is this, this, this guy, the yeah. CEO, the CEO yeah. over here. Yeah. Um, but clearly, you know, that's, it, it, it's important to tell the stories of what goes on behind yeah. the scenes and the work that gets done to make these seemingly just like miraculous events happen. Yeah. Uh, no, you're right. There's so much behind like, the scenes. It's so it's same thing as you see someone think, oh, they're an overnight success or an overnight celebrity. And it's like mm -hmm. that overnight was actually 20 years. You just didn't see That's it. Right. That's right. <laughs> I think it's That's very right. sort of in the same vein as that. Yeah. I agree. Um, well, cool. Those those are great examples. And I really appreciate you sharing them. And I want to pivot just a little bit uh, into more mindset stuff, because I think People listening to this, obviously, you've been leader of all these incredible organizations. You're still pushing the envelope. You're still doing stuff. So like this podcast, obviously, is Happy Not Satisfied. And I've talked before and I've talked to you a little bit just about what that means to me. And it's kind of this idea of finding joy from the, the process of continual growth. It's going to bed proud of what you did that day while looking forward to what you mm -hmm. kind of get to do the next day. Um, and I would love to hear just maybe how you relate to that or what your mindset has been through your life and through your career to continually get these milestones, but also like where are you at in terms of like the happiness and, and mm -hmm. the level of all of that that you feel on a day-to-day -day basis? Yeah. I, you know, I've, I've always struggled with this happy, not satisfied. I've, I've always struggled with, you know, being content and and being able to rest on my laurels and take a deep breath and just smell the roses. I've always had a challenge with that. I, I think it comes from my upbringing and my values. You know, I had parents who had tremendous work ethic values. You know, my dad built a company from scratch with his brother and my whole family worked at it. And I was working at my dad's company, you know, in the summers from the age of 13. I, you know, all my friends went to camp or went to Europe for ski, you know, for summer trips. And I was working with my dad, you know, carrying pipe and things like that. You know, he, was, he had a plumbing and heating contracting company, but he always had, you know, he always believed in the values of, you know, always, always approach everything with striving for excellence. You know, he would say, whether you're, you know, applying to college or sweeping a floor, like do the best job you can. And, um, and so I've always had that ingrained in me and, and don't rest on your laurels and, and, you know, the other thing that I developed my over my years that I always believed in, you know, I'm, I'm sure you've heard of that book, Don't Sweat the Small Stuff. And I actually don't believe in that. I actually believe in sweating the small stuff. I, and I think it's important to sweat the small stuff. Um, and again, because anything you do, it's a representation of you. Um, so that could be when you're sending an email to someone, you know, really thinking about what you write in that email, right? Or it could be checking for typos. You know, I'm a typo crazy about typos. And you know, I had an old boss back in my Morgan Stanley days who said, you know, if you don't think it's worth reading through this, to see if it's right, why would anyone want to, why else should anyone else want to read through this? You know, and it really stuck with me. And, and so it could be that it could be a, a conversation you have to have with someone that you, that maybe not a, there's some all important colleague conversation, but maybe it's a conversation you'd have to nip something in the bud or, and so you have to think, you know, really seriously about how you're going to approach that conversation. So I've always believed in that. And so I'd say all that said, I, you know, I, it, it, because of that, I, it, I've struggled with saying, okay, I'm happy. Um, on the other hand, I'd say as I've gotten older, um, I have tried to enjoy the journey more. You know, after we sold Time Inc., I took a, a, a ton of time off. I my, my boys at the time were 14 ish, and that's a great example where. 10 years ago, I may have just said, I'm getting right back into the next thing and I'm a hard charging guy. But I said, you know what? I'm going to stop and smell the roses. And I did all the things that you should do. You know, I, I taught their basketball. I was a basketball coach and we went on great trips, you know, different parts of the world. And I, I, I focused on some of my own hobbies uh, that I hadn't, that I neglected for a long time. And, you know, my wife and I spent a lot more time together, obviously, because I was home a lot more. So I've tried to, I tried to, uh, you know, enjoy the journey more. And I, and I do talk, when I talk to, I'm trying to mentor younger people now, 
you know, if you're going through a really, let's say a really tough time at work or a tough negotiation or, you know, maybe, you know, a really tough business situation, like I always say to them, I'm telling you, man, you will really appreciate the value you're going to get from this and you're going to learn from this. And I always find like when you look at, when you go back, you always kind of glorify and romanticize things, you know, like I work at Morgan Stanley, literally, you know, 80, 90 hours a week. And, and now I kind of joke about it and talk about how proud I am that I worked so hard. You know, at the time it was brutal, but I feel like, you know, really proud of the hard work I did back then. And, and, um, and so did I enjoy the journey while I was doing it? And was, was I, you know, happy and not satisfied? Not really. Yeah. Um, but I try to instill that on people that while you're in the process, just try to remember that what you're doing is going to be so valuable for you in the future and, and try to, you know, take out the, the stressful piece of it. I think it's a, an interesting mindset because I think some people, when, when asked that question, would say, well, I'm mentoring young people and I'm telling them that they need to have balance and this and that. And I actually... I struggle a little bit with how people perceive the idea of balance because I don't think if you think that you're going to be balanced, quote unquote, every day, and it's like, I'm going to only do this much work and then spend this much mm -hmm. time with my family and then do this mm -hmm. much exercise, like you're probably not going to actually be able to dig into any of those in a meaningful yeah. way. And yeah. so I almost kind of think balance is you have to have, you have to just sort of give in to these intense stretches where it's going to be really mm -hmm. tough and maybe really brutal knowing yeah. that you're going to get out on the other side and, and probably be better and stronger for it. And then you're kind of almost earning more of that balance in your life. The longer yeah. you go through that. Um, and it's, yeah. it's, it's weird. It's, it's because you, you do hear like work-life balance, all this stuff. And I'm not saying that's bad, but I think just throwing those platitudes out there is confusing to people because it doesn't necessarily then get you where you want to go. Um, and then you're stressed because you're not getting where you want to go, but then the yeah. whole thing is, gets you stuck, yeah. right? I, you know, for me, again, work life balance has always been a struggle for me as well. Yeah, and I, I agree with you. I, for me, I don't. I'm not the kind of person that says, you know, you should only work 40 hours a week and make sure you know you exercise every day and make you know there are times when you have to work harder in your job and you know and you're going to have to leave some things on the table. That said, I what I think what I try to do and I think is really important is when I when you do. Um, when you do take off time to do something outside of work, make sure you really are present for that. So I think when I was younger, I was bad at that, right? I'm so horrible I would, at that. I'm horrible yeah, so I'd say I'd go on vacation and I would work the whole time or I yeah. wouldn't be able to stop doing phone calls or I'd, you know, go on a, you know, go to a, a sporting event with a friend and have to take calls during the game. And in any case, look, when you're younger, you have a little less um, control over your time. If your boss calls you and says, we got to talk right now, like it's hard to say I'm at a baseball game. You know, sorry, the deal's gonna have to wait. But you know, nowadays I definitely try, and I and, and I'm and I'm actually a big believer in that with my team too. I'm the kind of guy like if someone says I want to leave early Friday because I'm going away for the weekend, I'm like, do it, have a great time. As long as your your work's getting done, I don't really care, you know. Or hey, I I need to take a day off because I want to take my 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 child to so and so. Do it, love it. So I'm, I'm less about like. Between Monday and Friday, you have to be completely focused on work. But when you do take time off, make sure you do, you know, switch switch off the work, uh, switch off the work light, and, and and make sure you're focused on what you're doing. Yeah, which is easier said than done. I think if there's anything in my life right now that I'm I'm trying to be better about, it's probably that and in being yeah. present in the time where. It's like, okay, I block off this time to, to not think about any of the stuff that I have to be doing or work or whatever. Yeah. And yeah. then 10 minutes in, yeah. you know, you're just thinking about it. <laughs> it's all Yeah. And look, and you know, I didn't mention this before, but you know, I had a dad who just worked a lot and was not home a lot. And, and so I've always felt strongly. And that's one of the reasons I took that time off when my kids hit 14 years old, because I said, I, I want to be here for those moments, right? I want to be here to go to the soccer game. I want to be here to go to the to the, you know, to go to a, to go take them to a concert together. I want to be able to coach the basketball team. And, and, you know, that was just really important to me. And and I think you know, probably many others as well. It's not certainly not just, I'm just like that, but I think, you know, the olden days, it used to be a little bit more like, yeah, you just, you know, it's work, 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 work. And if you can fit in family, you fit them in. And um, that was you know, a little bit of more of the old school thinking. Yeah. Yeah. I, I would agree with that. Um, and then, one just sort of, I guess, final point that ties into some of the, it, it ties into happy, not satisfied. And you kind of alluded to the fact that maybe you struggle with this is this thought of like, I'll be happy once I, um, mm -hmm. and that's, 
again, a, a big struggle, I think, for a lot of people, especially, obviously, you're very ambitious, you'd have to be, you know, to have achieved what you've achieved in your life and in your career. Um, and so do you have a way that you've thought about, like, how can you how can you be ambitious and achieve goals and do what you want to do? while not just being solely focused on those milestones um, and, and being able to, like you said, sort of be present and enjoy the journey along the way. Do, do you have any insight there? I do think it's really important to have outside interests, you know, um, that certainly helped me in my life so that, you know, you don't want to be one of these people who are, are so focused on, you know, accomplishments and success, particularly work related so that you, can't ever um, stop and smell the roses or enjoy yourself in other in other aspects of your life. So I do think having outside interest and in having hobbies that you that you're passionate about to me has been a savior for me. Um, and to me, there can be little things. You know, when I can, I'm a big Boston sports fan. Where I can just sit and watch the Boston Red Sox play a game on television for two three hours and have no one bother me. Like I really enjoy that. Um, you know, I have other hobbies that I that I like to focus on and, and put energy into. And so I think that's super important. And I think that helps, like anything, that helps take the edge off. It helps balance your life. It helps make, you know, at the end of the day, we all know this, but at the end of the day, work is important, obviously. But at the end of the day, you know, we all know what's most important in life. And it's it's your own personal happiness. And, you know, that that famous phrase, you know, it, they never put on your epitaph, you know, I wish I had worked more, you know. I know. I think um, about that all the time. Yeah. So that I try to think of those kinds of things. And I've gotten a lot better at that in my in my later years and in, in trying to not, you know, and trying to create more perspective and create boundaries, um, which I, I was not good at that when I was younger because I just, you know, I was such a hard charging, ambitious guy and I wanted to succeed. And um and I was taught that, you know, you got to keep going and don't ever quit, you know. And so yeah. I've learned, I've learned over the years, just when you mature, obviously you, you learn, you learn these things, you learn to take better care of your body. Mm -hmm. Obviously that's really important as well. And, and your, and your mind um, and such. So, you know, it's not a perfect answer, but that's, well, that's the thing. Of, some things I think about. As you were talking, I was, there is no perfect answer. I think that's kind of the point. It's just how do we all sort of personally reconcile all of the different things that we want to prioritize. Yeah. And I think lots of people are ambitious and want to be highly successful in their job and in their families, but also want to enjoy life and also, you know, want to have hobbies and, and, and other interests. And it's, it's a lot and it's a lot to juggle. And I think just at the end of the day, everyone's a little bit different and finding maybe some, even just like, like for me, the happy, not satisfied thing kind of turned into a mantra that I could remind myself of just to, if I'm really feeling it, that, that, quick little thing can help remind me but yeah. beyond that you know setting foundations and like you said being i think one thing i do think as time has gone on that the prioritization of like self health and self wellness is better now maybe than it used to be and i think it For can sure. keep getting better and i think that that alone helps people manage stress stress and manage the day to day you know if you find time to take care of your body and eat right and be mindful and all these things if you can lay that foundation i think then you can take on more and still sort of navigate it in a healthy mindful way so um yeah i've also found for me you know i found i'm a big believer in this and i definitely do more of it now as I, I i'm a big believer in recharging you know again mm -hmm. when i was a young guy and i worked at investment banking it was 24/7 365 you know you just never had a break and um i see such you know, again maybe it's because i'm older and i'm you know don't have the i don't have the stamina i had but i always find so much value in, in the in recharging and taking some time and i find that i'm more i i, I come back I'm not only recharged physically but I, i'm more creative i my mind is recharged as well and um and I'm a, you know, so I really try to focus on that too. Like, again, I think even about people who work for me, if I can see that they're working crazy and on a particular project or something, I would say to them, you know, take a long weekend, go leave, get this out of your head and, and recharge and go do something that, to, that you enjoy doing. And you'll come back a lot better versus, you know, just asking someone to continue to, you know, to just kill it. And yeah. It's just, it's just so short sighted um, that it, that it, you'll just burn out. Yeah. And I think that 
to me, that's balance, right? To me, that's balance of like, you can be really intense and really, really grinding. And then you give yourself this permission to recharge and, and just take a beat before yeah. you go back into it, as opposed to trying to do everything all the time, every day. And then you end up doing maybe not nothing, but not being nearly as productive ultimately um, with that approach. So I'm glad yeah, you said that. I agree. I think that kind of ties ties it all together. Um but I, I really appreciate you taking this time to chat. And I think there was some enlightening examples and, and conversations had here. So, um, you know, Perfect. I think you're a great example of somebody that has sort of blazed their own trail, created their own luck living happy, not satisfied, all the things. So you're perfect, <laughs> a perfect guest for this. So <laughs> checking a um, lot of boxes. Yeah, also. exactly. Exactly. So, so t- thank you for taking this time. And is there any, anywhere people can find you on the internet or, or elsewhere? Um, let's see. Not really. Not okay. really. I'm on LinkedIn. Saying, just not okay. LinkedIn. All right. You can find me on LinkedIn. Um, you have a website or like anything like that or I, th- I do have a, I do have a, I do have a website for that's, that's my, I think it's my name.com that, okay. I, that I have there as you well. Go. Uh, you All can right. find some things on me, but perfect. Um, yeah. Terrific. Um, yeah. Well, and if anyone wants to find out any more about Happy Not Satisfied, just quickly, you can go to our website, which is happynotsatisfied.com or the Instagram is at happy.notsatisfied. But um, Rich, it's been a true pleasure and hopefully we can catch up again soon. And I wish you all the best. Thank you so much. Yeah. And I, I really appreciate the time and um, continued great luck with and great luck that you're making, by the way, yes, with, with, your, with your podcast and, and, and continued su- success with it. Thank you so much. All right. Good to see you. You too. Yeah.